Here we go. Annie, if you're on, you're muted. Hey now. Now you're unmuted. Yeah, we'll get started here shortly. We'll give it a couple of minutes and uh, begin soon. Okay, that works. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the Alaska Municipal League and American Security Project for today's discussion on regional solutions to global problems, uh, specifically focused on uh, climate security in Alaska. Uh, pleased uh, to be joined. Um, uh, today with our guest speaker, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, for those of you who are um, online, uh, do feel free to utilize the Q&A function. Uh, we'll be able to take uh, questions uh, throughout um, and get to them uh, as we can. Um, and uh, really encourage your participation, which will uh, help our conversation overall. Uh, my name is Nils Andreasen. I'm the executive director of the Alaska Municipal League. Um, have been in this role for three years now, um, serving Alaska's 165 cities and boroughs, our, our local governments, um, and really working to strengthen local government in Alaska. Uh, prior to this role, uh, I served as 10 years as executive director of the Institute of the North, um, which focused uh, on uh, Arctic everything. Um, and uh, in that role, we contributed to the Arctic Council uh, Sustainable Development Working Group and projects therein, helped to host Arctic Energy Summits, um, and also helped facilitate Alaska's Arctic policy and uh, climate policy. So uh, the Arctic is not new to me, um, uh, though you know, when it comes to local governments in Alaska, uh, most municipal officials are focused on day-to-day -day operations uh, and that improve the lives and livelihoods of residents. Um, we know that um, global problems um, require regional and local solutions, um, but how that works, uh, especially as it relates to climate, uh, is incredibly uh, difficult. So excited about this conversation today, and again, uh, encourage you to ask uh, questions uh, throughout. Uh, our speaker today is uh, retired Brigadier General Stephen Cheney, uh, is the, and he's the president of the American Security Project. Um, uh, General Cheney is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy uh, with over 30 years experience as a Marine. Um, his career has included a wide variety of command and staff positions with operating forces and the supporting establishment. Um, uh, I should say something about your artillery experience, but it won't be maybe so relevant um, in the Arctic, we hope, right? Here we go. Um, uh, General Cheney has, has served in a variety of roles, otherwise uh, Chief Operating Officer for the Business Executives for National Security uh, in Washington, and most recently was President CEO of the Marine Military Academy in Texas. Um, he's appeared in multiple um, uh, speaking engagements um, and uh, most recent testimony uh, was on energy security, climate change and cyber uh, to the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. Um, he's been on the board of directors for the American Security Project since 2006 uh, and served as their CEO from 2011 to 2019. 
Uh, General, thanks so much for joining us today uh, and uh, for helping Alaskans think about Alaska, right, in relation to the Arctic, uh, this, this regional uh, aspect, and to this global challenge that we're faced with climate change. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you to further or better introduce yourself, uh, but would really welcome uh, uh, your remarks uh, on this topic. Well, Nils, thank you for that kind introduction, and I appreciate what the uh, Alaska Municipal League does, and uh, I know it's all for the good of everybody in Alaska and the country, so uh, we appreciate that. This, this is really a, a unique day in, in the whole year uh, in regards to what's going on in Alaska and our national security, and I say that because for two reasons. Uh, first off, the National Defense Authorization Act was passed today by the Senate for 2022. I mean, they've been working on it for a year. Um, and there was uh, a lot of hand wringing and people screaming, thinking it wasn't going to get done by the holidays, but it did. And there are parts of that that are relevant to Alaska. I'll talk about that in a minute. Plus that, uh, for those of us inside the Beltway who, wrote, who read uh, the local press, uh, the Washington Post had a big front page article today on the Arctic and Antarctic and the melting and, and some of the impacts on national security. So I just mentioned that because a lot of times when I talk to folks outside their butt where they think, now oh, you guys never think of us. And, uh, and, and in some cases, of course, that's true. But when it appears on the front of the Washington Post in a, in a multi-page spread, uh, then I can tell you it's got people's attention and, and well, it should have people's attention. So what I'm gonna do a little bit here is talk about the American Security Project for a couple of minutes. Then I'm gonna get into climate security as it relates to national security. And then I'm going to talk specifically about Alaska for a little bit. And then at the end, we can close it up and, and go to a, a open Q&A. Uh, American Security Project is a nonpartisan, nonprofit research organization. And we focus on the U.S.'s long-term national security threats. Our work examines topics like nuclear nonproliferation, counterterrorism, energy security, and of course today, climate security. And there's an intersection here between a lot of those, especially in Alaska. Now we've, we've got a board that's com that was originally comprised of three and four star generals and admirals. Uh, many of them are still on the board. The organization was founded in 2004, 2005 by Senators Kerry Hagel, Hart and Rudman. And the line I like to use is coming off the 2004 election, then Senator Kerry wasn't particularly happy with the results. And but what he's, he was equally unhappy about was that when he talked about issues that I just mentioned, in particular climate change, uh, he got somewhat painted as the left wing liberal that he is and people wouldn't listen. And so he sat down with Chuck Hagel, Republican, of course, and said, well, how, how can we get this message across that climate change is impacting our national security if people are going to put so much politics into it? And their thought was to create a research organization and they'll start with generals and admirals who had no political leaning left or right. Their, their really sole uh, purpose was to talk national security and security to the country. So that's how the board was formed. And, and it's survived now quite well. Our, our current uh, chairperson is Governor Christine Todd Whitman of New Jersey. And I'm proud to say that. And she's also a Republican. So we kind of, we go both ways. Chuck Hagel is, is still on the board. Uh, of course, uh, John Kerry is not because he had to drop off when he took his job as climate czar in the White House. In addition to what we have on the board, we have a cadre of retired general and what we call flag officers, generals and admirals, as well as former senior government officials and ambassadors uh, in a group we call the Consensus for National Security. And the consensus members support key policy measures that are designed for a smart and comprehensive 21st century national security. And we, we rely on them to host forums nationwide, other public events, and help use them to help educate decision makers uh, about the dangers of failing to address today's threat, specifically climate change. And we don't do this just inside the Beltway. We have traveled to 18 states plus over the past decade or so, uh, talking this specific issue. And, and the line I like to use is we go to where the rubber meets the road. Uh, the people who are directly impacted by climate change are feeling the effects and understand it. And, and then we relate that to national security and bring that message back inside the beltway. So we can talk, we can go up on the hill and, and we can do some limited lobbying as a 501c3. Uh, and I've, I've been in the offices of both your senators. And as you mentioned, I have testified in, in Congress as well. 
uh, really about climate security and national security. So let me talk a little bit about climate security here at home. Uh, taking a step back, I'll talk about the broader national security threats posed by climate change. And I'm gonna do some quoting here. According to the Department of Defense's annual list of challenges confronting the Department of Defense, quote, rising seas, extreme weather, such as flooding, wildfires, hurricanes, and a melting Arctic will require the Department of Defense to consider the security, readiness, and financial implications of these non-traditional threats. And that's a direct quote from the Department of Defense. Now, just as recent as this last October, the White House and the US intelligence community and the Pentagon all released reports that conclude that climate change can one, impact strategic in interests around the globe, can alter relationships with rivals, like China and Russia, we will also present new opportunities. And climate change will also destabilize nations, some, some that have nuclear capabilities. So you can see there is a genuine threat here. In a statement included in the Pentagon's report, Defense Secretary General Lloyd Austin right now said, quote, climate change is altering the strategic landscape and shaping the security environment, posing complex threats to the United States <clears throat> and nations around the world. Further on that quote, to deter war and protect our country, the Defense Department must understand the ways climate change affects missions, plans, and capabilities. I mean, that's important. And I, and I will, will look back over the previous four years before the Biden administration, this issue was, was hard to discuss uh, and not to throw a political slant on this. But as you probably know, there were significant deniers among the Trump administration and some in the Department of Defense. But I will tell you that those on the ground, the military folks uh, certainly understood what climate change was doing to their bases and stations and how it was impacting uh, instability throughout the world. At ASP, we have long discussed the ways that climate change, extreme heat, drought, wildfires, storms, sea levels, how they threaten US national security and our interests. Let me address military installations that I just touched on a second ago. They're all equally affected by extreme heat, coastal flooding, wildfires, and nothing new to Alaskans, permafrost thaw. Military installations in Alaska are located in a place that provides tremendous national security benefit. And today, more than ever now, when you look over the horizon, we start to worry. When you see what Putin's doing in Russia, what he's doing above the Arctic Circle, the threat that that poses to our country and the direct threat of missiles per chance coming over, the way they're gonna get uncovered is with Alaska, with your radar and detectors. And somewhat this applies to China as well. Uh, we really have to worry about China. Uh, China has two icebreakers. How many do we have? Two, hard to believe. They're not an Arctic nation, but we are. Uh, ASP has long pushed for having additional icebreakers. They've now budgeted for another one. The current commandant of the Coast Guard said he needs six. Uh, and as you can tell, uh, we're, we're very heavy leaning on the Congress to budget for more and get more icebreakers. Just as a point of reference, Russia has 40. So to put that into context, and of course, we don't have a deep sea naval port uh, anywhere, let alone not in Alaska. And we think we need one of those as two. Uh, providing the U.S. Uh, with a place to operate in the Arctic Circle and monitor Russian, Russian actions will continue to have paid huge dividends for national security. Uh, and it's going to be more important in the future than it is now. You are all well aware there are nine military bases in Alaska that serve these vital roles in the local community and with national security. But the military infrastructure is being directly impacted by climate change. And I'll just name some of them. You're familiar with them. Eelson Air Force Base, Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson, uh, Fort Greeley, uh, Fort Wainwright, and of course, the Alaska radar system, which I, I mentioned a, a minute ago, they're all at risk of weakening building foundations. For example, early radar warning systems are being damaged by the thawing permafrost and coastal erosion, and we have to adapt, rebuild, move if possible. Now, given the international implications of climate change and the direct threat to base installations, Congress and DOD are working to make US military installations more resilient in the face of increasing temperatures, coastal flooding, and perma permafrost thaw. thaw. Now, I mentioned the NDAA, the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act expanded funding 
for existing programs and created others to further address military base resilience and required the Department of Defense to update the 2014 DOD climate adaptation roadmap and DOD is doing it. Now the 2022 NDAA, which passed today, also included a provision specifically instructing installation commanders to form partnerships with local communities to build climate resilience. And of course that was across the entire country, but it's particularly apropos to Alaska. The military has long recognized the threat climate change poses and knows that action is needed now to preserve military preparedness and to prevent paying later as the cost of doing nothing is so exceptionally high. And policymakers at all levels have to follow their lead and take care of their communities. Let me expand this for a bit and talk about climate security abroad. The US isn't just worried about the potential damage to infrastructure and readiness that climate change poses stateside. We're also worried about the national security implications of climate change abroad. We know that big international problems around the world don't just stay there. Eventually they impact us here. The US has an interest of course, in a stable, predictable world, not one with civil unrest, not one with ethnic strife, not one that has fragile governments and that has failing ecosystems. But I think that's probably a nirvana. We are always gonna have those and be faced with that and will cause a threat to us. Now, climate change alone will not cause conflict, but it exacerbates the existing problems, such as water availability, food production, migration, overpopulation and economic insecurity. All of these issues have the potential to make conflict much more likely. And in addition, climate change is creating new missions for the US military, like, no surprise, naval surface patrols in the Arctic and humanitarian and disaster relief response at home and abroad. And of course, when you only have two icebreakers uh, and now that the Northern Sea Route is opening up and you will see dramatically increased traffic up there, uh, this becomes a safety problem as well. Now, however, destabilization of strategically important areas may be the result of climate-induced changes, not just the actions of foreign powers or terrorist organizations. And this is why we call climate change an accelerant of instability or a threat multiplier. I'm sure you've heard that before, but it, it really applies. With changing geography in your region, the thawing terrain has pre, uh, presented problems for the stability and reliability of infrastructure on such military installations that provide the ability for the US to monitor and respond to such events of international concern. Now, predicting where, when destabilizing events are gonna occur might not be possible. It may, however, be possible to identify the areas where the risks are significantly higher. Perhaps one of the most critical national security implications from a warming Arctic is the opening of the new trade routes and the increasing accessibility of previously inaccessible resources. And you see this all the time going around uh, with Russia and above us and Canada. This has changed the geopolitical dynamics of the region. And as Russia and China have intensified interest in the region, we've got to be aware. Now, the American Security Project had long done previous work identifying Russia's expanded military presence and increased investments in their military and industrial infrastructure in the Arctic. So this is an issue we've been looking at for years. In 2018, China announced that it seeks to take advantage of the opening trade routes to build a polar Silk Road under its Belt and Road Initiative, which you may be familiar with. Even more pressing, the new economic opportunities the Arctic has, facil has facilitated a deeper economic partnership between Russia and China. They just had a summit yesterday. Uh, and this has serious national security implications for the United States. Those two countries are getting together and they're ganging up on us. Many of these novel challenges from increased Russian and Chinese activity in the Arctic are a direct result of climate change and warming temperatures, and which has to come to some degree causing destabilization in the, in the uh, region. And to mitigate these risks, we need a systemic, dynamic, and deliberate approach for incorporating climate-induced changes into strategic action. So where are the US leadership opportunities? Unfortunately, even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, there's enough in the atmosphere to perpetuate climate-induced threats literally for decades to come. Doesn't mean we shouldn't try. In fact, it makes it more imperative that we as a global community achieve net zero carbon emissions as soon as we can. 
and the U.S. can lead the way. But first, we've got to catch China. Uh, U.S. businesses are at serious risk of falling behind global demands as infrastructure changes, and China is at the head of new technologies in the world, particularly in wind, solar, and battery production. And of course, they're also working hard on nuclear, which we should be doing more as well. China, hard to believe, is the world's, world's largest employer in, renewable, in the renewable energy sector, solar, wind, and hydropower, and has been for the last five years or more. In 2018, China alone was responsible for 42% of the new renewable power that was added globally. In 2019, more electric vehicles were sold in China than the rest of the world combined. In 2020, Alaska led the world in renewable energy growth, including installing more wind power and, as, and more than anywhere else, more than any other country in the world combined. But through strategic public and private investment in clean energy technology, we can catch China. And it serves four big purposes. One, it creates job opportunities for American, Americans in the clean energy tech fan, uh, sector, and it helps make US companies more competitive vis-a-vis -vis Chinese competitors, strengthening the US's relative power. And hey, it reduces US carbon emissions and it offers other countries an alternative to Chinese developed technology. And additionally, investment in and export of clean energy technologies, the US can create strong bonds with its allies in areas of strategic interest to the United States to include, for instance, South Asia and Central America. Let me talk about some regional solutions to address climate change. You know, I'd like to bring us back to why we are here. Climate change poses an existential threat to Alaska and the Arctic region. And the Arctic region is increasingly important to the United States national security, as I've pointed out. It's imperative that Alaska incorporates regional climate change solutions to protect its infrastructure, protect your native population from being disproportionately affected, which it is, and to maintain national security. ASP has been looking at this issue for a long time. We've done it in several other states. One in particular was Florida. Florida in many ways faces the same challenges as Alaska. They're currently facing unprecedented challenges with both coastal and inland flooding, intense periods of heat and increasing frequent uh, extreme weather, particularly hurricanes. And Florida is important to national security too, as they host many important military bases and infrastructure. To I'm gonna use them as an example to respond to these challenges and enhance regional collaboration in developing climate change solutions. They organized 10 regional planning councils and organized them under one entity, the Florida Regional Councils Association. Now these regional planning councils are made up of, local, of the local governments located in that particular region and they work together to already has a basic framework to build off of. And no surprise, the Alaska Municipal League has already done a lot of the groundwork in uniting, uniting the relatively isolated cities and boroughs under one common operating framework. This can be extended and enhanced using resources already established within the Alaskan Department of Commerce. The Alaskan government has Alaska Regional Development Organizations, acronym ARDORS, which function like Florida's regional planning councils, and it tries to enhance regional collaboration, specifically focusing on economic development planning. Economic development efforts tailored to the specific characteristics of the region will be critical in addressing the threats from climate change. For example, as many of you will know, offshore wind may be the best solution for a coastal town, while solar panels may be the best solution for an inland town. And all of this new and existing infrastructure will need to be resilient to the risk from climate change like melting permafrost. Now in this way, AML is in prime position as AML already represents 97% Nils, as you know, of Alaska's residents with the mission of being the unified voice of Alaska's local governments. AML can function similar to for Florida's Regional Councils Association, and it can be a voice and coordinating mechanism between the local communities, state resources, and federal and get federal funding to implement regional climate change solutions. Now, I know I've talked a little bit longer than I should, but in conclusion, 
Let me do another quote from uh, Secretary Austin. Planning for today and into the future is our business. And we would not be doing our job if we weren't thinking about how climate change will affect what we do. We in the military spend a lot of time mitigating risk. Climate change has become not only an existential threat to Alaska and the Arctic, but it's a threat multiplier that impacts national security and everything the military does. It can no longer be ignored. The rapid action, rapid action and investment is needed now to protect US interests and maintain our national security. Resilience measures must be taken while also mitigating the threat through new technologies and cuts to greenhouse gas emissions. The security challenges I've talked about will continue to be a problem and will worsen unless we dramatically reduce our emissions. The world's beginning to fight climate change, but the United States really needs to step up and lead. So Nils, that's kind of my pitch. I know, I, again, I talked a little bit long, but I think Alaska is on the forefront of this. Uh, this couldn't have been timed better, to be honest with you, than I think you've got the attention of Washington. So with that, let me turn it back to you. Uh, thank you so much, General. Um, at better you talk uh, more than, than me, right? So I think that's how this works. I uh, really appreciate your, uh, your remarks um, and that review of kind of where we've been and, and where we're at. I do have, well, I'll encourage folks on the line to um, post questions in the Q&A function um, uh, and we'll try to get those addressed. I've got a, a number um, spurred by your comments, uh, Steve. Um, I don't it, it feels, so I guess just to start at the beginning, it feels like for 20 years, Alaskans were saying, we're here, we're here, we're here, right? And Arctic and then climate. It, Alaskans have spent a long time trying to get the attention of Washington about Arctic and Northern issues. Um, and there have been different administrations, you know, over the last 10, 10 years who have taken Arctic and climate seriously or not. How do we, how do we make sure there's continuity between administrations so that, you know, Washington remains focused on, on this topic and, and not just focused on it, but, you know, in, pro provides a planning mechanism to, to keep that attention um, on addressing both the threat, the risk mitigation, and the opportunity uh, that you described kind of this race to renewables. What, what does Washington need from Alaska? I, I know we need lots from, from Washington. Well, uh, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on the political side of this and, and you all are familiar with it, but um, the, the issue is somewhat prominent in the Obama administration. And, and they, made, they made good progress there, not progress as much as we at ASP would like, but, but they did. In came the Trump administration and almost threw everything out the window. And I say almost with the exception of DOD. They had programs like it's called net zero where their bases and stations would ultimately be independent of the local grid and would be producing their own power. And in fact, giving power back to the local grid. That program still exists and is going full bore today. And it should. And there are several bases and stations that are, that are independent of local grid and produce their own power. So I, I think when you look at the national security side of it, again, go, going back to my military experience, I'll go back to Paris Island where I was the commanding general. Back in 99, 2000, 2001, we had floods mm, somewhat routinely, but not that much. Well, it's dramatically increased of late. And, uh, and they've had some hurricanes that have impacted the basin station. We recognized this back then, and we tried to fund to build a seawall, still hasn't been built. Um, but I can tell you the current commander who had to evacuate that base twice in the previous two years because of hurricanes uh, understands the impact of climate change. So it's, it's a lot of it's dependent on the Department of Defense. And that's why I harken back to Alaska, which, you know, Paris Island's important to the Marine Corps. I will tell you the, the radar system that you have in Alaska is far more important. The, uh, I mean, uh, that threat is there. And, uh, you know, you, you, you see what's going on in China with their missiles and their you know, now nuclearization and building more nuclear weapons. Um, Alaska becomes pretty important in this regard. So that's, that's just one aspect. Now to get that translated from administration to administration is tough. Enrolls the Biden administration. And of course they took one of our founding fathers and former board members, John Kerry, and made him the climate czar. 
uh, which was a good thing. And they have also have a climate czar for the United States. So they have really put a lot of effort into this. My suspicion would be that if a Republican got elected here in three years, uh, a lot of those programs might might die off. But but that said, local communities and, and states come back and say, hey, wait a minute, our bases are sinking through the permafrost. You started this. We've got to either um, we, what they call adapt. They have to adapt or rebuild or relocate. We can't just stop that because we've got a new administration. The threats aren't going to go away because we get a Republican administration in three years. I mean, those threats are going to be there. Um, so I, I think that's part of it. And and if you know, not to say if there's any value to it, but you have two great senators and they're two great Republicans, and and they understand this issue backwards and forwards. I can tell you. And so from that perspective, they will be the continuity if an, if a Republican administration comes in. You get a Democratic administration, I suspect, but can't promise. Well, if it's Biden who gets reelected, obviously these programs are going to going to flourish and continue. Maybe not in the same way, but but I think there'll be much more emphasis on it. So again, hearkening back to uh, where the rubber meets the road, it's the it's the folks that are most impacted on a daily basis here, and, and you are you are the ones who can say, hey, I don't care who's in office, you know, we need to survive. We need to protect the country. We need to have our defense establishment. We need to reduce emissions. So uh, that's a whole other issue that I that I can that I can address. But that that's the way I would Nils. That's the way I would go about that. Yeah. No, I I can appreciate that. And the um, I think that national security apparatus, Department of Defense, being that uh, that continuity is important. Um, and I think increasingly, I think that's increasingly true um, that. Uh, the Arctic and climate have taken on a place of importance for Department of Defense that um, keeps building. So that's great. Um, you, one of the things that I, I wrestle with often is how to reconcile, you know, what's a national threat, um, what's a, a threat to the nation versus, you know, for Alaska's perspective, local needs, um, subsistence and infrastructure and quality of life and economy, and that, that middle piece of regional infrastructure. And you talked about military bases, um, and we're experiencing that you know, across the state for any, any number of different kinds of uh, infrastructure. How, like those feel like three very different discordant discussions um, and, and priorities placed by different groups of people any thoughts on how we tie those things together, or maybe we don't have to? How do we, how do we place an emphasis on each that that helps to address each? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mentioned Paris Island. Well, I, I, I hate to denigrate my former command, but uh, the national security uh, risk, uh, the climate change affecting Paris Island, is not going to dramatically impact our national security. The radar station sinking through the permafrost will impact our national security. So uh, I think from that perspective, there are locations within Alaska that are more important to our national security and to the United States than, than many bases and stations here in the continental United States. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a proven fact. Uh, and now when you add in the China and Russia part of this, uh, and I didn't, I didn't even get into the Chinese fishing fleet, which is thousands of ships now starting to encroach on other countries' territorial waters for fishing, and that's gonna happen in Alaska. I mean, and fishing is one of your big economic uh, benefits in, in Alaska. I mean, that's there's another one that there's a national security perspective to this, but it's also gonna affect you locally, big time. And of course, when the Northern Sea Route opens up, which it already has opened up, there are ships going through and there are gonna be many, many more. And the Chinese have said they're going. Uh, that will impact you as well. And, and it, it also becomes a safety issue. Uh, and that's why you know, Russia will tell you the reason they have 40 icebreakers and the reason they're building more in bases station is they're gonna, they're gonna tax anybody going through the Northern Sea Route and, and they will provide the safety for it. And I, I buy some of that, but I don't buy all of it. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see the impact that's having on them and the impact it's gonna have on us. So um, there is no doubt that DOD dollars uh, will impact your, your local economy. Uh, in, in a big way, in a big way. And I, and I mentioned that because we haven't had a base realignment and closure commission now for literally decades, and we probably, probably won't because the congressional appetite is not there. 
but if they ever did, I can see your bases and station increasing, whereas others in the continental United States would, would decrease. And, and the long, every Secretary of Defense has said they've got X 30 plus percent excess bases and stations that they just can't close um, because, of, um, because of congressional liabilities. But on the flip side of that, there's also bases and stations that need to increase or get bigger. And, and I see that from the Alaskan perspective. So um, I, I think tying it to the NASA security side of the house, especially in the DOD perspective um, is important and, and, it, and it ought to be. And, uh, and I know your economy, you've got a significantly oil-based economy. I, I understand that. Uh, we're not getting off oil for a long, long time. So that's going to exist. But I think ultimately now, that's another avenue and it's another perspective here. You're gonna to have to think about trying to move away from a fossil fuel based economy, but that's a topic of discussion for another day. Yeah, and we certainly on that latter point, I know that ends up being um, kind of this uh, philosophical crisis that we often come up against sure. in terms of climate's <clears throat> impacts and our, our impacts to climate. Um, I do like though that, that you, did, you tied um, you know, national security to, you know, impacts at the local level and ways to tie those three pieces together. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I do, the Department of Defense kind of has three missions in, in the art, well, anywhere, but I think the way I understand it or think about it is sovereignty, security, and safety. Um, and, and that might be shorthand. I don't, know if it's true or, or, or not, but that's how I've heard it described. And I kind of like, it's an easy way for me to think about it. And I, I think sovereignty is really important because we, you talked about Russia and China, uh, an Arctic nation and an Arctic adjacent <laughs> nation is how they refer to themselves. Um, so America's place in the Arctic is important from a sovereignty perspective. And, and the way we exert sovereignty is through physical presence. Um, so military bases, um, icebreakers, etc. That's uh, crucial to, um, to to America's sovereignty. Security, though, kind of is harder. You talked about the radar bases that might be important. You know, our ability to mobilize from Alaska is important, but in terms of threat to Alaska, it's it very different than thinking about a threat to more critical infrastructure elsewhere in the nation. Uh, the bulk of I think the bulk of America's presence in the Arctic currently ends up kind of dedicated to safety, um, emergency response, uh, cruise ship traffic, um, uh, search and rescue, those kinds of assets um, are, are, are really more visible uh, from an Arctic uh, perspective than others. But can you, am I thinking about those things correctly or is there another angle to that that I'm missing? No, no, you're, you're spot on on all three of those, uh, you know, uh, sovereignty, security, and safety. But um, let me talk sovereignty. For, I'm, I'm going to take each one of those for a second. Yeah. Sovereignty first. Um, you, you, you see, we are obviously want to protect our lands and want to recognize where our territorial waters are. And I'll, I'll just touch on this one issue for a second, uh, because it's been a hot issue for AS, ASP for, for decades. It's the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS which you know, virtually every other country in the world is signed up to, but, but us. And so it's kind of hard when you don't even have a, uh, a seat at the table to sit there and talk about uh, challenges to your sovereignty and to people encroaching on your territorial waters when, when we never even signed up to it. And I, 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 I don't think I'm much far away from this, but our biggest argument is not with Russia, it's with Canada. And talking about the Barren Strait, and but but and they've filed uh, claims with UNCLOS, and but but we haven't. But I, I I'm not going to say I'm not going down that rabbit hole today. But one of these days, you'd think we would sign up to UNCLOS, but but we have not. Um, another one on the sovereignty side of the house, you know, don't think a lot, uh, Russia and China don't know that our 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 radar stations are where they are and where they're located, and, and not to say they're a target but they need to be protected and hardened and make sure they're safe and secure. And they, they understand that as well. So, I mean, there's a, a, a bit of a, I would feel a bit of concern about that. And it's a little bit of a vulnerability, if you will. Um, 
on the same thing that applies, of course, on the security side of the house. And safety is a, it's an interesting one. When the Crystal Serenity uh, navigated the Northern Sea Route, it took its own icebreaker with them. And they had another ship with its own sonar because about 75% of the Northern Sea Route is unchartered. And, and what, what do I mean by that? I'll, and I'll give you a, a very sad example. We had the USS Connecticut submarine run into a seam out here um, in the Pacific Ocean and, uh, about two months ago now. Uh, and it was navigating underwater in the far Pacific, but the same thing applies to parts of the Northern Sea Route. So you, they're, they're uncharted, you, they're, they're, you're not gonna go there, or you're gonna, you're gonna take sonar equipped ships, or you're gonna have to chart them. And of course, and, and it seems, some would say it's counterintuitive to wanna build more icebreakers when we're gonna have less ice. The, the, the ice is, is melting, but it's melting into icebergs and everybody's familiar with Titanic, et cetera, but, but you're gonna have much more floating ice pieces around the Northern Sea Route, hence you need an ice, uh, ice breakers to safely navigate those waters and hence the requirement now for, for more ice breakers. And that, that safety part of it is huge. And, and there's a com communication issue here. You may recall Shell used to be drilling up in the Arctic and they brought in a lot of their own communication equipment, then they gave up and some threw their hands up and said, my God, they're gonna take their communications equipment with us. There, there's woefully inadequate communications capability in the, in the Arctic, in the Northern Arctic. And that, that needs to be improved and built up. Uh, it needs to be um, funded. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a big vulnerability for us. And it's a safety issue, of course, um, for you Alaskans. So uh, those, those three issues are all tied very closely together. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, I enjoyed the conversation or the discussion. I think, I don't know if you said race to renewables, um, but it, it seems like that's the right phraseology for kind of us competing against other nations. And, you know, generally, uh, as we're thinking about climate change, you know, one, the, the real solution there is, uh, moving away from, uh, fossil fuels um at some point or i mean knowing that 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 transition will occur uh, i have to be careful too right because <laughs> uh fossil fuel economy um in in a lot of ways um but tell me more about this this race to renewables and um how is washington thinking about that is there there's a national security case i imagine there's a business case uh how else can we be thinking about or advancing that concept yeah, it's, it's an all of the above answer to this. I know that there have been indigenous villages in Alaska that have been moved because permafrost has, has melted them and, and they've sunk. Um, so, you know, there's a direct impact of climate change on those villages. A lot of those villages, I, I would think almost all to a point, might rely upon fossil fuels for their power. You got to fly in the diesel or, or cart it in somehow. Um, and part of the answer solution to their power problems is half the year at least having solar, uh, and then maybe another half of the year having wind, uh, of which you have a fair amount, especially on your coastal villages. So I mean, there's there's a power solution to for for those villages uh, that are that are that vulnerable. In terms of going to renewables uh, nationwide, or certainly as a national concern, uh, I can tell you from the DoD perspective. Um, the, the the quote I like to use is General Jim Mattis when he was in Iraq. Uh, he said, I, God, I said, I wish we could get off this tether of fossil fuels. And we've had well over a thousand soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines literally killed in Iraq and Afghanistan because they were guarding fuel lines and fuel trucks. And, and, he, and it just, it killed him because he said, hey, I, you know, if I didn't have to do that, if I had renewable energy, if I had solar energy, energy that I could use, if I had maybe even wind power or recharge trucks, um, he wouldn't. He wouldn't need those uh, fuel caravans, and uh, the same thing applies today. Bases and stations are now becoming more independent. I can tell you that DoD is working hard on trying to convert all their vehicles uh, to renewables. You know, the number one consumer of fossil fuels in the country is the Department of Defense, and uh, and the same thing applies. And uh, the biggest reason for that is the number of airplanes they have. I mean, the Air Force is huge, thousands and thousands of airplanes all burning fossil fuels. But a guy like, for instance, Fred Smith of FedEx has now run 
his entire air fleet on bio, uh, biomass uh, fuels for his airplanes. So that can be done. And it's, it's another way of, of getting off of, of fossil fuels per se and stopping uh, this tremendous uh, pollution of the atmosphere with CO2. And of course, the number one contributor to that is tr the transportation sector. So um, there's, a, there's a, you know, the, and, and lastly, I'll close on this one. There's been a lot of talk, some about nuclear power. Now we at ASP and some look at us and think, oh, well, you left-wing liberals. No, we're not left-wing liberals. We are strong supporters of nuclear power. The problem with nuclear power today is it has expensed its way out of the business. To build a new nuclear power plant in the United States literally cost billions, many billions of dollars. And to amortize that out, you're not going to get a return on investment. So no, they're, we're building none right now. Uh, whereas China's building them like crazy. Uh, and the, the, a lot of talk about small modular reactors that that technology is proven. The Navy's running dozens of them today, and they have since about 1955 with the USS Nautilus. They've, they've had small modular reactors and all their submarines, virtually all of them are nuclear powered. Uh, so you could create small modular reactors that can power the entire city of Anchorage, for instance, uh, which and now I, everybody's aware of the drawbacks of nuclear power. And I, again, that's another two hour conversation here. But, but when I, I, and, I'll, and I'll just say this, when you look back at the safety record of nuclear power compared to burning coal, for instance, there's is almost immaculate. The problem is when they have, a, when they have a, a major meltdown like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island or Fukushima, everybody goes, throws their hair up and tears their hair out and goes, oh my God, we can't have any more nuclear power. And I think they disregard the phenomenal safety record of nuclear power. But uh, that's just one other way that that we can help stop polluting atmosphere. And I can tell you that the Department of Defense is working on that. And then the private sector, you know, of course, what drives the economy is making it profitable. And look at what Elon Musk is doing with Tesla. Um, I mean, that's, that's caught the attention of virtually every automaker in the country. And I, I'm sure this is up in Alaska. You see it, I don't even see the latest Ford ad that shows a Ford F-150 powering up a house I mean, uh, pretty interesting. We see Ford doing that, and now, now I'm. You're all starting to see ads from all the car companies doing the same thing. They're all going to electric cars, so it's 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 going to happen. The economy is going to drive it. Um, you you're going to have more recharging stations. Tesla's got over ten thousand recharging stations in this country. You're you're, you're going to they're going to be more common than gas stations here in ten years. So th those are just ways that it's going to happen. Yeah, I'm. Glad you, I was going to ask you about nuclear. Um, I had a Russian uh, colleague who at one point offered uh, to bring one of their um, well, nuclear icebreakers to Anchorage, uh, decommission it as an icebreaker, and just hook Anchorage up to uh, a, a power supply. Um, it, it didn't go over well when they, when they approached the, the mayor and the governor about it back then, but um, it's a pretty fascinating concept where that's really all it would take. Um, and it, I mean, there's funding in the uh, infrastructure package to, to address some of that, maybe smaller scale nuclear options. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the Russian safety record of its nuclear powered ships and subs isn't, isn't, isn't flawless, I'll put it that way. So I'd be real reticent to have one of their ships powering your city. Just for the novelty factor, though, oh, yeah. don't do that with nuclear novelty, but um, <laughs> the, um, thanks. I, the, the thing that came to mind as you were talking about renewables and, and options for Alaska communities or American uh, communities is, you know, what are, you know, what are the, you know, apart from the kind of moral incentives related to climate, um, are there targets or kind of federal fiscal incentives to moving away from fossil fuel use to renewables at a, at a municipal level even, or a community level? Are there targets for each state to get to a 25% renewable energy portfolio by, is that something that's being worked on or discussed? Yeah, it's or is it's it certainly being worked on. I don't know if they're doing it. I don't think they're doing it state by state. I know the Build Back Better plan under, under Biden has uh, really increased the incentive incentives to one, build uh, electric vehicles in the United States with, with union labor and, and then the huge tax incentive to buy those. It's significant. I think it's like in the, in the realm of 
eleven thousand, ten or eleven thousand dollars, which is which is pretty huge. Uh, so they've really encouraged it from from that perspective. Um, you know, as you as you're probably aware, COP twenty six concluded here uh, last month. A conference of parties um, building on the Paris Accords, and that's that's another kind of a sad story. Of course, we we signed the Paris Accords uh, under Obama. Trump came in and, and pulled out within a year plus. Uh, now we're back in, of course, but we're playing catch up. Uh, and it, it's, it's incredibly difficult to get 150 plus countries all signing up to the same thing. They made a, a valiant effort this time around and you know, they established the target of a reduction of two degrees centigrade um, in a couple of decades. So, I mean, it's, that effort is there and other countries are some are doing better than we are some are, obviously many are not um but but that effort but we put i know that secretary Kerry has put a lot of work into the, into that whole side of the house and i can tell you they're working on it big time as a national uh a national policy um procedure so uh, but i i don't i don't i just don't know if they're doing it i doubt that they're doing it state by state right i would imagine states objecting to that but um it's still I, mean, I think uh, often in the kind of Arctic climate conversation, you know, I hear fingers pointed at Alaska for, you know, why aren't you doing more to combat climate change in the Arctic? And Arctic and climate became synonymous for Americans versus, um, you know, one being a, a regional uh, discussion around development and infrastructure and security. Um, and, but that climate feedback loop kind of entered into the discussion and um, and I've, I've seen some discussions kind of pointing to or blaming uh, the Arctic for climate change when it's really not, it's not how that works. That, that's um, so, it's, it, to me, it's so ludicrous. Right. Uh, I mean, I'll give you one small example. When I first got stationed in the early 70s at Camp Pendleton, California, uh, the smog from Los Angeles would, unco would cover Camp Pendleton, which is about 50, 60 miles south, uh, routinely, just routinely. And then in the 80s, it started to dissipate by 90, 90s. It was pretty much gone, mostly due to the catalytic converter and stopping the pollution, a lot of the pollution coming out of cars. I only mentioned that you look at the population of the, uh, the suburban population of Los Angeles, what, 10, 15 million? Right. Compare that to Alaska? I mean, come on. Right. You know, come on, give me a break. But I think that's that's right. How do we make climate change an American issue, um, an Arctic an American issue, and translate it out for Americans to really understand those things uh, thoroughly and the difference they can make? If if Alaska communities need to move to renewables, then you know America's communities need to move to renewables, and American states need to think about it in those terms. Um, I know we're running up on the uh, end of the hour, but uh, you did talk about AML's role, potential role for ardors. Um, it, it kind of uh, seemed um, so kind of localized regional strategies for economic development related to renewables. Is that kind of the, the gist of, of what you were talking about? And I think that's something that we can take up, but tell yeah, me more. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of ironic when you, when you try to compare Florida to Alaska because <laughs> the temperature difference alone and uh, it, it is just, just no comparison here, but, but Florida's got huge problems with climate change. The, and, and I'll take Miami as an example. The, uh, the, the sea level rise is, is, is coming and it's happening there routinely. Their biggest problem is they can't build a seawall because the ground is porous and it's coming up through the bottom and, and they're gonna lose a significant portion of Miami. So they got a sea level problem. And of course, when you look now at the hurricanes in the last couple of years, we have been the largest number of named hurricanes that we've had in history. And where do they go? They're, a lot of them are going right through Florida. So now they've, they've recognized this threat. And of course, climate change is contributing dramatically to that. And, and to, to put it a, another tag to this, if the Antarctic ice shelf and the Greenland ice shelf uh, melt significantly, they're going to see a sea level rise, not in inches, in several feet. So they, they have now, okay, we have a problem. And we really need to band together and, and try to fix this. And, and that's where that organization comes from. And I, and I think the same applies to Alaska. Uh, I mean, there is a problem here. And you're seeing it, you know, with, certainly with the permafrost melt, which is perhaps the biggest one now, 
but with the with the Arctic ice cap melting. And then I think sea level rise is going to pose problems for some of your communities as well. Um, not so much catastrophic weather, uh, but you're going to have erratic weather too. So, I mean, that's, it's definitely going to have an impact on Alaska. And, and, and the way to help address this is to bind, bind together all your local communities and then speak as one voice, certainly to your legislators, certainly to the ones obviously going to Washington and say, hey, we need to fan this flame and keep it going and let them know that it's so important to us. And we, by the way, we need to be funded for it. Uh, more so, I hate to say this, than some other states in the Continental 48 who, don't, who one, aren't as critical to our national security infrastructure, and secondly, don't, don't have the same threat that, that it is posing to you up in Alaska. So I, I think that's an important thing for you all. Yeah. Um, thanks. I, yeah, I mean, thinking about Florida, the per capita impact of climate change uh, is very different between Alaska and Florida. Um, but I also, I mean, I, I like that you tied it back to, you know, you've got to think about it in, the, in very different terms, these different levels of, uh, of risk and threat and economic impact, uh, community level impact, and each of those different spheres are going to Sure. have a different relationship to different states um, and, and national security. You know, I, I meant one other thought that just crossed my mind because ASP is working a lot on the illegal fishing side of the house. But what you're seeing now is the ocean is warming, all the oceans. And you're seeing a migration pattern doing, uh, of certain fish species. And that could impact you all. It could be positive. You could be having who knows what kind of fish come up and grow in, in your waters, but it could do just the opposite and drive species uh, significantly away. And other, I can tell you other countries are seeing this um, and, and China's certainly seeing it. That's why they're sending thousands of thousands of ships around the world, stealing fish from others' territorial waters. So it's, it's another thought. Yeah. General, thank you so much for joining us today and, and talking through these uh, uh, important issues, not just for Alaskans, but uh, for the nation. Um, really look forward to continuing um, this discussion, uh, cooperation. Glad uh, the American Security Project's out there paying attention to this, um, and we'll definitely keep advancing this uh, within our congressional delegation and um, up for through all the different channels that we have available. Um, and think about the work that we can do on our own. Absolutely. I will, I will tell folks listening, they go on our website www.americansecurityproject.org. All of this is on our website. Uh, you can, all the climate change stuff, some of our Alaska work is up there too. So uh, I appreciate the work you are doing. And we're, we're in, as we say in the artillery, we're in direct support. Wonderful. Thank you right. so much. Thank, Thanks thank everyone. You.